already matched. Right. Uh, the missiles have been uh, pre armed. Eight years after the Wright brothers first flew, an aeroplane dropped a bomb. Within 40 years, an aircraft could destroy a city. Three, two, one, missile away. Now it can lay waste a country. This awesome aeroplane is the American B-52, B for bomber, the 52nd since the United States commissioned its first in World War I. The deadliest aircraft in history, it can carry 40 tons of conventional bombs or a 15 megaton nuclear device. It can circle the Earth, the supreme embodiment of air power, the strategic bomber. Bombers have brought a new and horrific dimension to warfare, annihilating people, demolishing cities, obliterating landscapes. Conventional bombing reached its climax in the war in Vietnam. In a 10-year campaign, the United States dropped over six and a half million tons of bombs, more than was used in the whole of World War II. Every type of bomb was used. Every type of bomber flown. The fighter bomber, caught up by radio in support of the troops on the ground, and dropping its napalm just yards away from its own GIs. The medium-range bomber, sent in to destroy the enemy's communications and supply lines using the pinpoint accuracy of laser-guided bombs to hit its targets. Most terrible of all, the strategic bomber, the B-52 itself. Summoned from thousands of miles away, it rained destruction on economic targets deep in the heartland of North Vietnam. The effect of such a bombing on his victims was shattering. We had surrendered to us an NVA soldier. We hadn't been standing there and watching him in the trench more than a couple of minutes before one of our own jet aircraft flew over at some distance from the hill. Whereupon this man literally dissolved into, 
into shaking and uncontrolled uh, uh, reaction to just the sound of that jet going overhead. We found that, for instance, if we simply clapped our hands, the man would defecate standing there. Uh, the, 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 he was psychologically destroyed by the constant heavy bombing. Just 30 years separated Vietnam from the war that first experienced the full impact of strategic bombing. It was 1936 in the Spanish Civil War, and it was the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, which demonstrated the power of the bomber as a weapon of terror on civilian targets. On August the 14th, 1936, the Luftwaffe launched a series of air raids that would change the face of war. Spanish cities held by the Republicans were to be the testing ground for this new kind of offensive. Madrid, the first target. But the climax came eight months later with the destruction of the undefended town of Guernica. More than 1,500 people were killed in the bombing. The air raids sent shockwaves round the world. A devastating and, it seemed, irresistible way of waging war had arrived. The Germans now unleashed another military revolution, Blitzkrieg, the Lightning War. It integrated troops, tanks and aircraft in one combined assault. Here was a new job for the bomber, to support the soldiers as they advanced. Enter the Stuka, a dive bomber, whose shriek could chill the bravest heart. And in the Blitz war, troops must be moving, and uh, the armed spearheads, if they run into an obstacle which they couldn't overcome, then the uh, Air Force had to send a squadron or a group of Stukas. For this reason, in the first armed cars was always a Stuka pilot as a connection officer, and he was in radio contact with the leader of the Stuka group, which attacked. By this contact, it's was possible to drop bombs sometimes nearer than 100 meters in front of their own troops. I think you have to be cool to do it. And if you cannot be cool under vicious conditions, you might be a nice fellow, a good pilot otherwise, but not for this special job. When you start the dive, for a young fellow, the whole world belongs to you. It's really an amazing feeling. You dive with a speed of 450 kilometers. Then you have to keep the aircraft straight, clean, for three seconds. You have a horn, like in the car, that gives exactly the height where you pull out. And you have switched it, let's say, to 2,000 feet. And when it yells, then first you drop the bomb and pull out. level, of course, you apply full power because now you run for life. As the German armies launched their invasions, Guernica was repeated across Europe. In one devastating air raid, the center of Rotterdam was flattened. Five hours later, the Dutch government surrendered. It was the bombers' moment of triumph. It seemed now nothing could stop it. All that lay between the conquering German armies and complete victory in Europe was Britain. Hitler gave Goering and his Luftwaffe a new job,
to prepare the way for an invasion across the English Channel. What he needed now was not an air force in support of the army, but one that could seek out and destroy key strategic targets in Britain. The mainstay of this air assault was the bomber that had proved itself in Spain, the Heinkel 111. Small by later standards, it had a crew of four, carried two tons of bombs, and could fly a round trip of 500 miles. By the end of the war, over 6,500 of these aircraft had flown with the Luftwaffe. The Heinkel 111 was for all of us, every crew that flew it, a kind of life insurance. The machine was reliable, good-tempered, was easy to fly. Anyone else in a Junkers 88, for example, or any other more complicated plane, would have had more worries than we did in a Heinkel 111. serious business and the tension increased the moment we reached the Channel Coast. The nearer we got to the English mainland, the higher the tension became. No one spoke much. One simply said, right, 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 or left, 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 hold steady, now I'm ready. The Luftwaffe assault on England began in July of 1940. Its first targets were the RAF's airfields. Its aims, to deprive the British of their main line of defense against the bombers. But the German Air Force now faced a new experience. Far from their bases, they came up against defended targets. For the first time, bombers confronted the determined resistance of fighters. So the Battle of Britain began. The British now introduced a new defensive weapon into the battle, radar a device which, by transmitting radio waves and picking up their echoes, could detect solid objects at a distance. With radar and other electronic developments, the British defenders could work out the location, numbers and range of the approaching bombers. They could then scramble their fighters at the most effective moment. the German bombers suffered enormous losses. By the summer's end, they had still not broken the British defences. The bomber had received its first setback. So Goering changed the tactics. Now the Luftwaffe would raid by night. Darkness offered greater security to the vulnerable bombers. But darkness brought problems too. How do you find a blacked out target at night over a strange country? The Germans developed an electronic system of their own. Two converging radio beams that told the pilot when he was over the target. But the British countered with a device which bent the beams. Suddenly, we couldn't hear the beam anymore, and when it came back, we found we were 17 degrees off course. We couldn't find Derby or our alternative target, so we decided to fly home. We dropped our bombs in the channel. Landing with bombs is no life insurance. And so the whole raid, as it is so beautifully put in airman's jargon, has gone down the trousers, was a washout. 
On September the 7th, the attacks on Britain's capital began. At its height, the Blitz raged for 76 nights, but it failed to break the people's spirit. The bomber had suffered another setback, as American correspondent Quentin Reynolds told the world. From the clouds, hell was let loose. I saw the magnificent work of your grand firemen and ARP people, all honor to them. As the flames roared, Londoners set their teeth and took it on the chin. But it wasn't a knockout. It gave birth to a grim determination that the Germans should pay dearly for such destruction. Britain's only means of hitting back was to launch its own bomber offensive. The greatest advocate of this policy was Chief of the RAF's Bomber Command, Sir Arthur Harris. The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else and nobody was going to bomb them. At uh, Rotterdam, in London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather naive theory into operation. They sowed the wind, and now they are going to reap the whirlwind. The Lancaster was the British bomber that took the offensive back to the Third Reich. It had a crew of six or seven and was armed with eight guns. With a bomb load of 10 tons, it could fly deep into Germany and back. The RAF had learned from bloody experience how vulnerable lightly armed bombers were. So the Lancaster bristled with a formidable armory designed to beat off the German fighters and batter through the German defenses. When the Lancaster came along, you felt that at least you were going to survive and also be effective against the enemy. this backfiring of the exhaust, the bang-bang of the thing as it turned over, and then this enormous surge of power as it picked up. You did this four times, and each time the, the engines picked up, you know, the extra crescendo of noise, the vibration increased, until the whole aircraft was shaking. The thing began to gather speed, and the whole thing was absolutely vibrating with power. If you put your hand on the metal, it felt as if it was hot. It was zooming, 2,000 horsepower, practically in each engine. That's the sort of power that's running through the frame. And you knew you had to get everything out of the aircraft to get it over the end and up into the air. Because we had such tremendous loads, we took 14,000 pounds of bombs to Berlin. The Lancaster of the heavy bombers was the winner for Britain. She was a gentle aircraft. She had plenty of latitude. You could throw her about. Uh, she was the ideal heavy bomber. But tough as the Lancaster was, beyond the protection of short-range fighters, it was still vulnerable. We tried bombing in daylight, and it was impossible. You couldn't get through the fighter defenses. It was suicidal. We had to bomb at night. 
And the moment you bomb at night, you lost your accuracy. So there came the moment when either we stopped the offensive or went to area bombing. Area bombing meant bombing whole cities rather than specific targets, a controversial policy after the war. But for the British people in their darkest hour, the only way to strike back, a fitting revenge for the Blitz. For the young air crews, flying bombing missions over Europe was a deadly dangerous job. In the whole of the war, only German U-boat crews faced greater risk to their survival. The tour of operations was 30. The squadron I was with had first Wellingtons, then Lancasters, and we were operating anything from 20 to 25 aircraft a night. In something like 14 months, I don't suppose I saw more than about a dozen crews finish a tour and go off. So the expectation of life was not high. Now, to keep on in that knowledge, I always found to be quite extraordinary. We're losing up to 80 or sometimes 90 aircraft a night from the command, getting fairly close to the 10% attrition rate, which is regarded as uneconomical. And uh, although it improved later, nevertheless, it was a pretty harsh prospect. We had no means of knowing at that time what happened to aircraft and crews. They just disappeared. Some of them became prisoners. But as far as we were concerned, they, they'd gone. They used to have a briefing a few hours before the takeoff time. There used to be a screen at the end of the hut, uh, curtained. And uh, when the commanding officer came in, uh, he used to say, right, lads, this is where it is tonight. He'd pull the string, the curtain would open, and then on the wall there was a huge big map of Europe with a red ribbon going from your base to wherever the target was. And we all used to look, first of all, where the end of the red ribbon was, and if it was Berlin, we all used to say, oh, my God, not again. The thing which used to impress me about so many of these young pilots flying a four-engine airplane, they couldn't drive a car because they weren't old enough to get a license when the war started. They could fly a bomber, but they couldn't drive a car. <laughs> you had your own ground crew. They attached themselves to you and you to them because you depended on them for your life. And they were all sensing that you were going out and they were behind. But you felt that you were all one because uh, you did the same thing. You, you came together on that dispersal. And in the fading light, um, this was the last moment, possibly some of us would see them again. We got into the aircraft. The um, rear gunner was going to his outpost in the rear end, and it was uphill gradient to the cockpit, and the rest of us were climbing over the big central main beam of the main plane, and this was a sort of grand national hurdle, because by this time you were getting a bit tired, if you like, of um, the physical effort. And I suppose the mental block, that really, this is not the place for you. Once you'd uh, gone into the sky, you were virtually on your own. Uh, it was dark, we didn't have navigation lights. Quite often, the only reason you'd know there was another aircraft there was when you'd get a bump as you crossed the slipstream of another aircraft, but you probably wouldn't see it. You were virtually on your own. It was an individual effort. Every aircraft had its own smell, and I can smell it now, a mixture of high-octane fuel, hydraulic fluid, rubber, even the Elson giving off smells, you know, they had a chemical Elson in the back. It also, I think, a mixture of fear, you know, at the same time. They took uh, flasks of coffee and tea. They also had uh, flying rations, so-called chocolate, which was precious, chewing gum, wine gums, and things of that sort. And they would very often use these to pace out the flight. 
you can see growing on the horizon this big cauldron of light with lights flashing, intense white light of the buildings burning, the splash of the incendiaries going down, the pinpoint of lights which was denoting bombs going off and the constant flash of the anti-aircraft fire. So you got this effect of terrific pyrotechnic display, which was silent. It's like very slow film being unrolled beneath you. The whole thing doesn't seem to be getting closer. And you think, by God, for God's sake, we're sitting here. Uh, <laughs> and you're waiting to get those bomb doors open to get rid of the load and pull up and pull out. So you're just sitting there like a big goose for the fighter to pick you off. The only feeling that you've got is you're in the herd and you hope somebody on the outside of the herd is going to get picked off and it's not you, so they might be satisfied. You see people opening the bomb doors and you see people in front, their bombs leaving. The load of incendiaries, which are carried in a long container in the Bombay, tumble in the air like matchsticks. When they strike the ground, they're an intense fire which is difficult to put out. If it's a block bus, you see a big red ball of fire welds up and dies down. When you press the button, you get a feeling of elation. You feel this is where you're getting your own back. You're going to hit them. You feel the bump as each bomb goes. If it's a big one, 4,000 pounds, you can thump. You can feel the release through the seat of your pants. And the aircraft is no longer sluggish, but it's more alive. And you just couldn't get those doors closed quick enough and go into a nose-down position where you've got extra speed and pulled away from the target. It was a great feeling to cross that coast and you could see the friendly fields and hedges if it was coming dawn and the familiar approaches to the airfield. And as you were approaching, you could hear the girl in the tower and you called her up and you got the acknowledgement and it could possibly be the girl that you dated the night before. But you have a sense of well-being or homecoming, if you like. They had petrol flares and it was very misty, big tallow oil cans. It looked like Dante's Inferno with these long streamers of flame going up and the smoke was coming off them, but it did create the heat in a misty atmosphere or a foggy one to lift it that much so that you could get in underneath it. You had that sinking feeling as you were approaching and you were holding the aircraft back and you're losing airspeed. And you got that moment of stillness before you hit the runway and the first thing was the bump and the screech of the tires. I don't know whether the screech was the tires or everybody going, ah, you know, at the last minute you were here. In Germany, men and machines were mobilized to combat the bomber offensive. By early 1944, the Germans had night fighters that dominated the skies, causing terrible damage to the British squadrons. In one raid on Nuremberg, 108 bombers were shot down. Increasingly sophisticated radar installations, searchlights, flares, and over 30,000 anti-aircraft guns meant night no longer offered the bomber protection. The British offensive faltered. Only with Allied air supremacy over German skies would it resume its momentum. When America joined the war in Europe, it created new air forces to take part in the bomber offensive against Germany. The American commanders put their faith in precision bombing with the inherent risk of daylight operations. To begin with, their air crews were quite unprepared for the sort of battle they were getting into, as one of their commanders, Curtis LeMay, soon realized. The pilots I had, especially, they'd come right out of flying school and had about 200 hours on single-engine airplanes. The uh, bombardiers I got two weeks before we went overseas. Navigators, half of them, the first time they saw an ocean, they navigated across it. The gunners, I'd supposedly been to a gunnery school, 
They never shot a gun from an airplane. We never flew formation until we got to England. It was a complete debacle. They just couldn't do it. The B-17, the Flying Fortress, was the bomber the United States relied on to fly in daylight without fighter escort deep into the German heartland. It carried half the bomb load of a Lancaster and cruised at an altitude of 25,000 feet. But it was heavily armored and heavily armed with 11 machine guns. The B-17 was a very strongly built airplane. It had the old DC-3 engine in it, it four of them. That engine had been around a while, been pretty thoroughly tested. And, you know, you had to take a direct hit at it to knock it out or cut a fuel line or something of that kind. Now, the airplane was slightly underpowered, but it was a good engine. Easy to fly, very forgiving. It had a big, thick wing on it. I saw one torn off because the airplane was in steep dive, and the wind force tore it off. I never saw a wing blown off an airplane the whole war. These airplanes took lots of bullets and a lot of shrapnel and uh, survived. We got a, took a direct hit in the number two gas tank over Leo. Uh, it ended up with a hole that was probably six feet by six feet, completely through the wing. You could have dropped a desk completely through the wing of the airplane. The fire was so big, the tail gunner could not stay in the tail. It got so hot from the gasoline burning. And we couldn't feather the propeller. And yet, we flew the airplane back and landed it with no trouble. We did not have enough guns on the airplane. That uh, We had a real problem in trying to defend ourselves in the sky. Even though we had the famous flying fort with a lot of machine guns, we didn't have enough. We learned right off, for instance, and the Germans learned this quickly, that we could not fire straight forward because the top turret guns could not come down below level and the belly guns couldn't shoot up. So the front was open. The Americans, like the Germans and British before them, suffered great casualties in daylight. But they endured their losses until finally the arrival of Allied long-range fighters brought them the protection they needed. All of the men on the air crews were uh, volunteers. Nobody could be assigned flying duty. Uh, they had to volunteer first. Many of us might have changed our minds had we had better foresight and had anticipated the flak, the fighters, some of the tougher raids like Berlin, Hamburg, and Munich. We never knew any of the crews because they were just planes going by in the morning on a mission. And we'd go outside the hangar, watch him go by. Once in a while, wave to one of the pilots, if he'd wave back. I know I was saying a prayer, and I'm pretty sure the rest of them were saying it. They didn't say they were. But if you talk to them today, they were saying, yes, we did. To protect his unescorted bombers, General Curtis LeMay introduced a new formation called the Combat Box. Aircraft were stacked and staggered in such a way that each bomber in the group was covered by the guns of every other one. Flying at high altitude, uh, particularly depending upon the humidity in the air, you would get uh, contrails coming off the engine, the condensation of the exhaust. It was a beautiful sight to see, but it was a terrifying sight because it not only gave away your position to the gunners on the ground, but it also allowed the German fighters to fly up the contrail and attack you from the rear almost unannounced.
participated in one of the thousand plane raids and seen the number of airplanes in the sky at one time was just appalling. It was absolutely fantastic. There were planes all over the sky, as far as you could see, wave after wave after wave of, of planes. The thing that, to some degree, I liken it to would be the movie The Birds. The inhabitants of the village looked up and, and the sky was black with birds. And I guess that's kind of what it looked like, literally a sky full of planes. Shells explode right near your aircraft. You can hear the fine shrapnel hitting the airplane. And it's just like hail on the tin roof. The next three shots is going to be right with you, maybe in the Bombay. Seeing it explode, and they had different colors. They had red and green, and they had some purple. And that stuff is scary looking, and I was scared. No question about it. You see ACAC going off just outside your window. You don't see people on the ground. But somebody shot that ACAC up there. So you really don't see people. You divorce yourself from it, it's what you do. be a plane out there with an engine burning or something and be two or three German fighters just they just come in on it and just riddle it to pieces. The German fighters would normally attack the full group. They didn't wait for cripples, but if there was a cripple in the area, he was really fair game. B-17. Right next to us. Got a shell. First time I'd seen one go down. And it spun off to the left. And parachutes began to come out of it. One, two, three. You're counting. You're trying to count to nine. And everybody's counting, but you think, you don't realize, you think you're the only guy counting. And as, as the parachutes came out, you count them off as safe, safe, safe. You have to pay an admission price every time you go over there. You're going in enemy territory to destroy some of his resources. Now, he's going to try to prevent you. You're going to have some losses. If you're going to pay an admission price, you better get something for it. You better hit the target. Now, if you've missed the target and you have to go back again, the admission price is about double what you paid the first time. And uh, this is what happened to us a lot of times. 11,000 American bombers flew against the Germans. Almost half failed to return. Some of the planes that came back really shook the crews up in the hangar. We didn't know any of the men, but we more or less could feel what they'd gone through. Or 
we didn't expect was to get into a plane and maybe have to clean up the blood of some poor fellow that got shot up or find pieces of clothing. Once in a great while, you might find a little piece of a body. And probably it maybe affected us a little more because we didn't know who it was. If we'd have known the people in there, maybe it, we knew what the man was like or something like that. Maybe we could have got away with it that way. But this way, we all we knew, it was some American that had been in there. All I can say is losing a friend was the hardest part of this war. And I've lost a few, I'll be honest with you because we were really close. A combat crew couldn't be any closer than a, than a husband and wife or... And, well, I, I just don't want to think about it, okay? The price paid in the lives of the air crews for the Allied bomber offensive was enormous. The RAF lost more than 55,000 men, one in seven of all British Empire deaths in action. American losses in the European theater were greater still, 94,000 men. The cost to Germany was catastrophic. Hundreds of thousands dead and the ruin of its cities. At Hamburg, it was just unbelievable. The amount of smoke, the amount of flame. Uh, we flew by Hamburg about three days after the major part of the raid, and the smoke trails were, were as far as you could see, and the fires were still burning. We had three targets in Hamburg and couldn't find any of them because of the smoke and the fire. The day after the armistice, they allowed us to come down to 600 feet and just look. Uh, ordinarily, on a mission, you're at 23, 24,000 feet, and you don't see much. But at 600 feet, it's different. The city was totally devastated. There were no streets. I mean, you, you couldn't find streets. And all the bricks and the buildings had just caved into the street, and it's, it's just, it's always made in my mind. You knew that the civilians couldn't survive. Then again, we weren't that concerned about them, because they were the enemy. So what did the bombing offensive in Europe achieve? Not as much as its champions had first thought it might. The bomber did not defeat Germany on its own. It did not break the morale of the German people. But it did divert resources to air defense from other hard-pressed fronts. It kept many of the Luftwaffe's fighters tied to their home bases. Perhaps most important of all, for a long period, it was the only way the Western Allies had of hitting back at Germany. In the war in the Pacific, American bombers faced a different problem. Until 1944, Japan lay beyond their reach. It was too far, even from the airstrips hastily dug out of the desolate terrain of the Aleutians, the strip of islands stretching across the northern Pacific. But then came the capture of islands closer to Japan, like the Marianas, and at last a major bombing offensive could begin. The key to this air assault was a brand new bomber, the B-29, the Super Fortress. The biggest and most advanced bomber of the war, it was fast, over 350 miles an hour and with its pressurized cabin could fly at heights well above the flak. It was well armed and had five gun turrets, two on top of the fuselage, two on the bottom and one in the rear. But above all, with its range of over 3,000 miles, here at last was a bomber that could hit Japan. At the start of the offensive, the Super Fortress used the same tactics employed in Europe. They flew unescorted by fighters. 
But cloud cover, common over Japan, obscured their targets and limited the damage they could inflict. Once again, the losses were appalling. Each mission was losing 6% of its planes. Statistically, no air crew could expect to survive a tour of 25 sorties. Then General LeMay arrived from Europe. He ordered a change of tactics. Now it would be incendiaries instead of high explosives. Lower level runs in place of high altitude raids. Within months, the new policy had paid off. First Tokyo in a devastating firestorm, then other major Japanese cities were reduced to cinders and rubble. Soon the super fortress could roam at will across the Japanese skies, systematically destroying the country's industrial base. By mid-1945, strategic bombing had brought Japan to its knees. Now it was a couple of B-29s that would deliver the knockout blow. On August the 6th, 1945, a B-29 named Enola Gay, after the captain's mother, took off from the Mariana Islands. Its target, Hiroshima. Its mission, to drop an atomic bomb. The explosion was equivalent to 20,000 tons of TNT. It destroyed the city's center, killing 78,000 people in its blast. Three days later, a second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. It was the ultimate in terror bombing. Six days later, Japan surrendered. For the United States Air Force chiefs, the lessons of the war were clear. Bombing worked, and they now had a monopoly of nuclear weapons. They also had another new bomber, one that could take off from America and reach targets a continent away. The B-36, a monster of an aeroplane with six piston and four jet engines. Crew, this is engineer. Refresh your eyes. If you don't smell the gas fumes, it's okay to smoke. Inside the aircraft, there was comfort and space undreamed of by the air crews of World War II. Here was a unique opportunity. The air chief seized it. They set up an independent bomber force, SAC, the Strategic Air Command. General LeMay was put in charge of this new air force, whose job was to deter aggression with the threat of mass destruction. But the general was not happy with the state of his new command, so he put it to the test under wartime conditions. Not one airplane, not one airplane in the Strategic Air Command finished his mission as briefed. They had absolutely no combat capability. Zero. So LeMay developed the concept of a peacetime air force on a wartime footing its bombers armed and ready for action at all times. Okay, brakes are set, battery. On. Interphone's on, stand by to start engine. Clear, right. Clear left, hit him. The bomber that carries out this mission for the Strategic Air Command is the B-52, a plane that has already had an operational life of over 30 years. The B-52 has been around for a long time. It was a magnificent airplane back in the 50s when it came out. We're in awe of it. I think we're a little less in awe of it, but it's still a magnificent airplane. The first time I walked up to one, it did seem almost too big to fly. 
I have to admit that there are times during flight I look out at the wings when we're just cruising along, and, and I really do wonder what keeps it up there. Over the years, we've shored up the wings. We've improved its engines. We have improved its avionics capability immeasurably. We have kept it flying, and it's served us well. The B-52 was the airplane that dropped the first hydrogen bomb on Bikini Atoll in 1956. Its only active service was in Vietnam. Here, it came up against defended targets. Even with the United States in control of the skies, this bomber, like its predecessors, was found to be vulnerable. The new threat was missiles. When we started using it uh, in and around Hanoi in uh, December of 1972, we had to accept some losses. And that, of course, showed to us that uh, at high altitude, uh, in a surface-to-air missile defended area, that. Uh, that we were going to be taking uh, some hits or some losses and losing some aircraft. That's why this has been built, the B-1, the US Air Force's answer to the challenge to find a bomber that can penetrate the enemy's defenses. It's the most expensive bomber ever produced. Expensive because of its state-of-the-art avionics. Two tons of electronics to jam the enemy's radar yet more to find the target. No wonder two of its four crew members are electronic systems operators. Eight nuclear missiles or 84 conventional bombs are its payload. Its shape is designed to reduce its visibility to radar. The B-1 can fly at 600 miles an hour, 200 feet above the ground. The ultimate strategic bomber. It has a daunting and difficult task, even if all the sophisticated electronics work. Many people remembering previous bombers think it can't be done. That is why the Strategic Air Command is holding on to its B-52s till the end of the century. The bomber has changed the face of war. It has made every street and village a front line. It has wrought mass destruction on an unparalleled scale. It has not, despite the claims of its early champions, won wars on its own. But so awesome is its power, it remains a most formidable weapon to have on your side. <laughs>